If we were to ask you to think of history's most evil leader, who would spring to mind? We're willing to bet that it was a certain Austrian painter whose name would get this video demonetized were it spoken this early. No doubt he has earned his infamy as one of, if not the most evil person to ever hold a nation's reins, but yet, tragically, He's got plenty of competition. In today's video, we're going to be turning to some of the darker pages of the Human Chronicle and exploring five of his lesser known competitors for that most contemptible crown. Our first terrible tyrant today is likely no stranger to you, certainly had more than his fair share of airtime in the late 20th and early 21st century, and so you might be surprised that we should choose to include him on this list of lesser known evil leaders. But while we may all know his name, how many of us actually know about his life and crimes? Probably not that many, so let's plug that gap. Saddam commanded the Hell of Iraq for almost a quarter of a century, holding the nation in an iron grip from 1979 to 2003. His rule, while outwardly marked by by nationalistic fervor and grandiosity was, in fact, a fearsome reign characterized by an unquenchable thirst for power. And accordingly, Saddam's Iraq was a nation in which there was no shortage of knives ready to be plunged right into the back of anyone who might threaten his power. Born into modest circumstances, Saddam's rise to power was a tale of ruthless ambition, one that saw him machinate his way through the hierarchy of the Arab socialist Ba'ath party, rising right from the very bottom to the very, very top. From here, his ambition only continued to crescendo, and he finally assumed power in Iraq on the 16th of July, 1979. Hussein's modus operandi I revolved around a single core principle. Fear. He instilled fear through his secret police force, the Mukhrabarat, who were notorious for their relentless surveillance and ruthless enforcement. Dissent was perceived as an existential threat, deserving of swift and brutal retribution. In Saddam's Iraq, the hallmarks of tyranny were all too evident. Mass arrests, brutal tortures, and summary executions were commonplace. His regime was a dystopian reality, where even the faintest whisper of rebellion was crushed mercilessly. However, it was his inhumane treatment of Iraq's ethnic minorities that truly showcased the depths of Saddam's evil. The Anvil campaign, a genocidal crusade against the Kurdish people that ran from 1986 to 1989, was the zenith of this. The campaign witnessed mass deportations, chemical warfare, and systematic mass murders. The campaign also spawned the Halabja chemical attack, where an estimated 5,000 Kurdish civilians fell victim to deadly chemical weapons on a single day in 1988. Further still, his narcissistic machination were not just confined to Iraq's borders, as he led his country into two devastating wars with Iran and Kuwait. The former, the Iran-Iraq War, was a harrowing eight-year-long ordeal that resulted in up to 1.2 million deaths and unimaginable destruction. The latter was the Gulf War, which was sparked by his unprovoked invasion of Kuwait in 1990. There, his military, then the fourth largest on Earth, was absolutely obliterated by an international coalition of nations in mere weeks. But while his rule was, to all intents and purposes, an absolute disaster, his narcissism still saw him award himself the kind of extravagant lifestyle that would make even Roman emperors of old envious. While his people suffered, he indulged in the construction of lavish palaces, ostentatious monuments, and self-aggrandizing statues, a clear depiction of his warped priorities and indifference towards the hardship of his citizens. In 2003, his reign came to an abrupt end following the US-led invasion of Iraq. Captured and subsequently put on trial by the Iraqi interim government for his numerous crimes against humanity, Saddam met his fate on the gallows, leaving behind a legacy drenched in fear, oppression, and bloodshed. And with that short, sharp drop, Saddam's tale comes to an end. So now let's take a trip to the Far East and have a look at our next loathsome figure. Like Saddam Hussein, Pol Pot is another name you're likely familiar with, but have never actually gotten into the nitty gritty of. Throughout the historiography of the 21st century, his name is spoken in hushed whispers. A name that forebodes such malice, such pain, such wanton slaughter, that to many it is no lesser in disdain than that of Hitler himself. And as we shall discover in the next few minutes, certainly 
deservedly so too. He seized control of Cambodia in 1975 under the red banner of the Communist Party of Cambodia. For the ensuing four years, he presided over a short but horrifically violent reign of genocide, cultural annihilation, and forced labor, staining the nation's soil with a layer of blood so vast that it has yet to be washed away. Pol Pot's leadership was powered by a radical vision of an agrarian utopia, a classless society where all citizens would be equal laborers in collective farms. The realization of this radical ideal began almost immediately after he seized power, with his chilling Year Zero campaign, which saw cities forcefully emptied, their inhabitants herded off to harsh labor camps. Meanwhile, intellectuals, professionals, and anyone else deemed a threat to his vision of purity was brutally executed, their crime being their supposed links to Western ideologies or ties to the previous regime. Under his iron grip, Cambodia experienced one of the most extreme societal transformations in human history. His rigid striving for classless agrarianism plunged the country into an abyss of hunger, of disease, and of death, as every single institution that had previously helped Cambodia to function as a nation completely collapsed following its workforce's relocation. Cambodia essentially became a national-scale concentration camp, a dystopian hellscape where hope was crushed underfoot and survival was a daily battle. Yet the horrors went further still. Pol Pot's radical vision sought to not just agrarianize Cambodia, but also to dismantle the very fabric of its culture, targeting money, private property, and religion. Buddhism, an integral part of the country's identity, was viciously suppressed. Monks were stripped of their religious status or outright murdered, and temples and artifacts were defaced or destroyed. This assault against the spiritual core of Cambodia was just another layer in Pol Pot's multifaceted campaign of tyranny. However, the defining horror of Pol Pot's rule remains the Cambodian genocide. An estimated 1.7 to 2 million individuals, roughly a quarter of the country's population at the time, were wiped out between 1975 and 1979. These lives were lost to the twin specters of execution and overwork, or to the silent killers of starvation and disease. The killing fields, mass grave sites scattered across Cambodia, stand today as grim reminders of this horrific era. Pol Pot's reign came to an end in 1979 when the Vietnamese army invaded and toppled his government. Pol Pot himself, however, eluded justice, spending his remaining years leading a guerrilla movement from the jungle until his death in 1998. His demise, free from the grasp of justice, leaves a sour note at the end of this monstrous figure's tale. It's hard to think of a single other leader who has managed to cause so much damage to a nation in such a short amount of time as Pol Pot did to Cambodia, and the nation will still be carrying the scars of his tenure for decades, if not centuries to come. The evils of colonialism in Africa are no secret. A catalogue of ruthless leaders, unjustified violence, and unrelenting exploitation form its loathsome litany. Yet even among such grim contenders, one figure stands out for the sheer enormity of his malevolence. This ignominious tale belongs to Leopold II of Belgium, who, under the cloak of progress and civilization, executed a reign of terror and unfathomable brutality in what is now the Democratic Republic of the Congo, but back then was simply known as the Congo Free State. From his gilded throne in distant Europe, Leopold ruled over the Congo from 1885 to 1908. During this period, the Congo was not merely a Belgian colony, as you might initially imagine, but rather it was his private fiefdom, a human workshop churning out wealth for him and him alone from the sweat and blood of its enslaved native inhabitants. Taking a step back, Leopold ascended to the Belgian throne in 1865. At first glance, he was just another 19th century European monarch, donning the royal mantle and carrying the expectations of his country's prosperity. However, beneath this regal veneer lay a heart poisoned with insatiable greed and a yearning for imperial grandeur because, for Leopold, little old Belgium was not enough. And so his gaze turned southwards towards the vast and mysterious landscapes of Africa. Like a spider weaving an intricate web, Leopold conceived a masterstroke of deception. At the 1884 to 1885 Berlin Conference, which was called to carve Africa up among the European powers, he proposed that he should be given control of the Congo, claiming that he would civilize the Dark Land. The proposal captivated his fellow European leaders, who approved wholeheartedly, and so, following the conference's conclusion, he formally claimed sovereignty over the Congo and began administering it as his own personal colony. From this point, 
the Congo metamorphosed into a vast labor camp. The unsuspecting Congolese was subjected to the harshest conditions, their lives bent to the will of their far-off king. Their labor was focused on the extraction of two of the Congo's most lucrative commodities, ivory and rubber. The quotas set were merciless, and the penalties for failing to meet them were horrifically brutal. Leopold's officers often severed the hands of those deemed underperformers, as well as torturing and imprisoning their families. But its very worst, entire villages were wiped from the face of the earth for failing to meet their quotas, a brutal warning to their neighbors of the consequences of disappointing their colonial overlord. The population of the Congo dwindled drastically under Leopold's reign, with estimates suggesting a loss of around 10 million lives, roughly half of its total population. This chilling figure encompasses those who fell victim to the vile repression we just discussed, as well as deaths from starvation, exhaustion, and exposure as a result of Leopold's inept leadership. Mercifully, there was at least some resistance to this in Belgium. Thanks to the courageous effort of whistleblowers like Edmund Dene Morel and Roger Casement, Leopold's reign of terror was exposed, igniting fury the world over. But sadly, it's been the early 20th century. This didn't lead to the Congo's independence, rather just that the Belgian government then started administering the Congo instead of Leopold. This did not end the suffering of the Congolese, not by a long stretch, but it did at least put an end to the more extreme brutality. So let's remain in Africa for one more section. But we'll now take a trip further to the north and have a look at Francisco Marcias Nagema, the first president of Equatorial Guinea and self described Hitlerian Marxist. Nagema ascended to power in 1968, right after Equatorial Guinea secured independence from Spain. His rule, which extended until his gruesome end in 1979, was one of the darkest periods in the nation's history. Driven by a noxious mixture of paranoia, delusion, and megalomania, he transforms the fledged nation into an isolationist state and committed horrendous atrocities against his own people. Once in power, Nagema began consolidating his control through a series of oppressive policies. He outlawed all political parties except his own, declared himself president for life, and systematically set about dismantling the country's institutions, effectively making him the sole authority. His hunger for power was insatiable. His self-aggrandizing delusions apparent in his various titles such as Unique Miracle and Grand Master of Education, Science and Culture. Has he never met me? But he was not content with mere political and institutional control. He also embarked on a vicious reign of terror against his own people, executing and brutalizing scores of perceived political enemies following sham criminal proceedings. The flames of horror appear to have been fanned by his extreme paranoia and unpredictability, with whimsical purges against imagined conspiracies being a recurring feature of his regime. Not that you had to be perceived as a political enemy to be on the receiving end of his brutality, however, because for the public, they lived under the constant threat of torture, brutalization, and of course execution, simply for being in the wrong place at the wrong time. What's truly horrifying about this violence, however, is the sheer scale of it all, with up to 400,000 people, one third of the entire population being either killed or forced into exile during his reign. Furthermore, his tenure also saw a calculated destruction of the country's cultural and intellectual heritage. He systematically targeted the educated classes, resulting in a brain drain that crippled the country. This suppression extended to religious institutions as well, with many churches shut down and clergymen persecuted. The gamer's rule also brought economic devastation to Equatorial Guinea. His erratic and ruinous economic policies, coupled with widespread corruption led to a dramatic decline in the country's productivity. By the end of his rule, the once prosperous cocoa industry was decimated, and the country, despite its abundant natural resources, was one of the poorest in Africa. In 1979, a coup led by his nephew, Teodoro Obiangagema, ended his brutal reign. He was subsequently put on trial for his crimes, a rare instance of a tyrant facing justice. His execution, however, brought little solace to a nation scarred by years of brutal oppression. Rather, it marked the beginning of a grueling journey toward healing and recovery. The economy was left in tatters, and the societal fabric was wrecked by years of systemic fear, atrocities, and political purges. The psyche of the population, traumatized by years of oppressive rule, needed time and effort to heal. Decades of intellectual and cultural decimation had to be overcome as the nation sought to rebuild its identity and reclaim its stolen potential. Governance structures had to be established anew, a challenging task in a nation where trust in the leadership had been eviscerated. Indeed, the transition from Nagama's despotic rule to a functioning state was not swift or easy, but a slow 
a painful climb from the dark abyss into which the nation had been plunged, and one in which arguably the country has yet to recover from to this day. For our final tire end of today's video, we must head across the Atlantic Ocean to South America, specifically to the Dominican Republic, a nation haunted by the ominous specter of Rafael Leonidas Trio, who held the nation in a tight grip of terror for more than 30 years. He seized the reins of power in 1930, and what followed was a ruthless and relentless pursuit of total control. Under Trio, the Dominican Republic was not a nation, it was a grim fiefdom gripped by fear and stained with the blood of innocence. What set Trio apart from other despots was not merely his authoritarian rule, but the audacity and scale of his power hunger. Within no time of establishing himself as the head of state, he embarked on an all-consuming quest to consolidate his power. Any voice of dissent was ruthlessly suppressed, opposition was brutally eliminated, and surveillance became as ubiquitous as the tropical sunshine. The scale of his egomania knew no bounds. With Trio adorning his image across the country and renaming streets, cities, even mountains in his honor in a grandiloquent display of his perceived omnipotence. Yet, Trio's malevolence extends beyond mere egomania, seeping into the horrifying realm of systemic human rights abuses and unabashed racism. The apex of this reign of terror is perhaps encapsulated in the infamous Parsley Massacre of 1937, where he ordered the systematic extermination of Haitians living near the Dominican-Haitian border. This horrifying act, estimated to have resulted in the deaths of up to 30,000 innocent people, was an unprecedented display of savagery that still sends shivers down the spine today. Internationally, Trio was a master of duplicity. While his brain brewed terror at home, he managed to craft a surprisingly positive image abroad. Leveraging the Dominican Republic's geopolitical position during World War II and the Cold War, Trio successfully portrayed himself as a reliable ally to the United States and other Western nations. Beneath this facade, however, the grim reality persisted, with Trio using his international clout to keep political scrutiny at bay, while his brutal domestic policies continued unabated. Furthermore, the economic disparity under his reign was every bit as stark as his autocracy. The Trio built an immense personal fortune, largely through corruption and exploitation, while the majority of Dominicans languished in the shackles of poverty. Any pretense of economic growth or modernization was just that, a pretense, and the supposed benefits rarely trickled down to the common people. Trio's iron grip on the Dominican Republic finally ended with his assassination in 1961, but the fear and oppression he sowed continued to cast a long shadow over the nation and the period following his assassination proved to be an arduous, winding path to recovery. Trio's long, repressive reign had left the country in a state of socio-economic distress and political instability. Yet the resilience of the Dominican people shone through the darkness of those days. Slowly but surely, they began to mend the fractures of their society. The first steps were the hardest, with the country initially falling into a period of political volatility and economic hardships. However, this gradually gave way to a more stable governance, and with it, a modicum of economic improvement. 